special announcement here. We at the Business of Architecture love to help you win more great clients and projects. And we're offering a very special 45-minute one-on-one breakthrough session with one of our senior members which is a 45 minute call. And in this session, we're gonna help you map out a simple action plan. And this is gonna be based and, uh, on, on experience of working with hundreds of architects and helping them increase their income and the quality of projects. And it will be tailored to you depending on your budget and your goals, and of course, your ability to be able to implement. So we love helping architects and we wanna help you attract and win more better opportunities for your practice. So that is the one-on-one session. It's a free session, uh, but in order to be able to qualify to have one of these sessions, we do require some certain criteria. And the first of those is that you are the owner, partner, or main decision maker for an architecture, for your architecture practice or a architecture practice. You must be able to have the ability to provide exceptional service and results for your clients. And you must be targeting at least a further £100,000 in additional revenue for your practice. So if that sounds like you and you want to speak to one of our senior advisors and jump on one of those breakthrough session phone calls, click on the link that's in the information and we look forward to speaking to you. Yeah, as an architecture firm, you're there saying, well, how how are we presenting ourselves? Because I think that does translate into business. Business Architecture UK, episode 47. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I am your host, Ryan Willard, and this week is coming to you from Viner Street in Hackney, in the heart of East London, where I was in um, Ombra. Actually, I wasn't in Ombra. I was in the studio of Fourth Space, uh, who an architectural practice comprised of Steve Sinclair, uh, Paolo Mazzato, and Hugh Williams are the partners there, and they actually own the restaurant Ombra, which is where some of the well, where the Negroni talks are happening, and it's become one of these hotbed scenes of architectural discourse. And it was a really, really interesting conversation because it's one of the few times I've seen this work successfully is an architectural practice owning a restaurant and actually in in using the restaurant as the kind of their their front room, if you like, um, their meeting space, and also use it as a place to facilitate projects, to facilitate discussion. And Four Space have also got a very interesting structure of how their de- uh, directorial team works, um, and they're well known for doing a lot of local work in the in the borough of Hackney. Uh, they built their own office, um, and. It was a, a fascinating conversation to see how this practice has was born, their approach to architecture and developing relationships, and also what they have learned from owning and organizing the management of a restaurant and how that entrepreneurially has impacted and enlightened them in the world of running their own architectural practice. So Steve, Paolo and Hugh have all got very impressive um, backgrounds. Steve was at the Macintosh at the Bartlett. He worked for Morf- Morphosis and Ron Arrowed and Fat. And um, uh, Paolo is originally from Venice. There's, there's this kind of wonderful Italian refinement that comes through in the restaurant and he's so laid back and cool. And, and Hugh worked for Meccano in the Netherlands and they were just an absolute joy to speak to. So sit back, relax and enjoy Fourth Space. Absolute pleasure to be here. So you guys have got a very interesting company structure. I know that uh, one of you is involved purely in the planning. Not quite. Not quite. How, how does it, how does it how does it work, and how and how did you guys come together? Uh, the company came about. We 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 all worked together in a company called um, um, Harper Mackay in um, the late nineties in Clerkenwell. Um, over time, people go their separate ways. The company did, and so forth. And we eventually, uh, Paolo and I, set up Forspace um, a good few years ago. And Hughes recently joined us. <laughs> To complement, um, um, you know, the the, the, the things that um, Paolo and I um, had been struggling with, um, right, as business to sort of 
get new forms of clients and get more consistency to the practice. Um, my background is um, design-led practices. Um, Hugh's background is similar. And even but Paolo's, your background to some extent, is that they're all kind of design-led back, uh, backgrounds. Um, but I seem to have a bit of patience on the planning side of things. I, um, I've done a, a, a course in um, um, uh, the theory in the city and eco economics at the London School of Economics as part of the city's course. It was the theory side of the course rather than the design course. Right. And um, since then, I've had an awful lot of experience in very awkward, difficult planning um, uh, projects and have dealt with um, a variety of local councils over the years and currently I do a bit of pro bono work with Hackney Council on their estate regeneration housing supply programs. And I kind of got into that because I've been in the area in Hackney for about 25 years. Right. And um, they know who I am up there. Um, they know my background and everything and experience with, with planning. So it's, it's, it's good to give a little bit back. Yeah. Um, Planning is often in the early parts of the project, and I think you know it's about um, early parts of the project about getting things opened up and making them happen a little bit, and then there's a kind of um, potentially a kind of middle and an end as well. And I think um, the three of us complement that, but also um, uh, we overlap a lot. So there's yeah. no dedicated person who just deals with planning or just deals with construction. There's actually quite an over an overlap between mm. the three of us, and and with our staff, we try to encourage a similar um, overlapping kind of degree of skills. Yeah. Um, um, uh, but I guess the speciality is me being planning, Paolo getting things out of the ground, and 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 Hugh really on the consistency of of of, of design and following through. Right. Um, no, I was just about to say though that I think the, the story you're trying to tell a story as well about the practice, and I think when I came in, I had a, a different experience to these these two. They, these guys had done a lot of work for developments at the planning end through to construction. Mm. I was coming from a building refurbishment background with a more interiors base. So when I joined, it seemed to me that you could play on the idea of the tri trilogy or the triumvirate of people and sort of almost um, set it up. I mean, it's slightly artificial to, to say that Steve's planning Paolo's construction line finishing, if you like, as it is on our website. But I think it's quite concise and clear, and obviously there's a lot of crossover and grey areas within that. But right. it's, it's sort of setting a, your stall out to somebody to make it as clear and, and, um, and easy to understand as possible. Because I think, you know, sometimes people think architects are, you know, what what is your strength you know and uh, you can be obviously you can work in certain sectors um and also you can only do just planning jobs and you never build anything out or you never do the interiors and i think it was a, a sort of trying to present a holistic approach that what you do at planning you're doing at interiors at turnkey level so i think it was a it was part of a the rebranding of the firm following my arrival that it just became quite nice with the three of us as personalities to put those three key stages right. and assign them to our characters, if you like. Got it. Um, and that caricature on the website is sort of you know, part of that as well. So, yeah, that was kind of the way and, it and, sort of developed. And so before you joined when it was, it was, it was you two, and was it still called Force Space? What was the... Yeah, yes, it was uh, called Force Space. From, what, from was, where does the name come from? <laughs> very, very difficult. Uh, I mean, the, the legend says that um, we were sitting at table number four. Yeah. yeah. Decided with another chap sitting at table number four um, that we wanted something uh, with the word space in it, and we just picked it out for space. But there was a lot of um, um, uh, theoretical writing by the likes of Ed Soja and a lot of post-colonial writings about third space, um, which is about um, um, spaces of um, in-betweenness and change. And uh, four space seemed to be. Um, a kind of follow-on from that where um, temporal aspects into how cities adapt and change over time or how one might um, um, change over time over their career and how mm. um, uh, their, 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 their um, you know, temporal shifts, I guess, um, affect them. Um, so there was a kind of jokey side and a kind of slightly more meaningful side. Yeah. Yes, it was. But also, I mean, in a way, it's always been then 
uh, you can see this in the way we do architecture because uh, it, we don't have a particular style and because we tend to consider every site with the, the fourth space, mm. uh, which is the, 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 the locality and the history and the future as well of the place. Yeah. So in this, it's um, yeah, unicity. And, 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 and therefore, the, it doesn't, we don't really have a style repetitive of every single, I mean, obviously, like every project has a, is a un, unique, has a unicity, but uh, yeah, particularly for us, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's seeing that. What would you say is one of the keys for a successful partnership like this? Patience. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> and having a, a, a restaurant and bar as well. <laughs> so that I mean, so yes, that, that that leads us quite nicely on as well, uh, talking about the the restaurant and the bar and how that's become, uh, you know, quite a sort of a, a destination in itself for the architectural industry, where you guys are hosting interesting talks and Negroni talks, and you know, there's always a influx of architects around there. How did how how has this come about? I mean, obviously, the bar was set up by Stephen Paolo six or seven years ago, and it was Paolo's sort of brainchild coming from Venice. He always he wanted to set up a Venetian restaurant, and the opportunity in the street was there to do it, um, and it was executed, you know, on a very low budget. And mm. uh, and it sort of, I mean, when I when I came across, I you know, I'd been working freelance for these guys a little bit, and you know, you know, you just used to go there, and it seemed to um, be more about the character. You know, through the the internal fit out, really. I mean, the refurbishment of it was very much sort of, um, you know, fitted the budget of them as their own client in a way. So, mm. um, and it had a nice vibe to it. I think it, you know, particularly European sort of sensibility of eating and drinking um, in a relaxed environment. And I think whenever I used to go across, um, it, it sort of became apparent that you know, with especially with the office upstairs. I mean, we're in obviously the attic of this building, and you know, you have no street presence. <laughs> I mean, in fact, your street presence is zero. So there was an obvious opportunity that you could use that as the front room of the office. I mean, we, we use it to, you know, as a second meeting room anyway because it's obviously a congenial place to meet people and over a drink, uh, whether that's alcoholic or otherwise. Um, and so it was just a natural progression to say, well, let's use it as a shop front to the office. Let's actually do something beyond the work. Um, you know, we've always been keen to... Um, not just be jobbing architects, mm. you know. I mean, I I paint, you know, and stuff like this. So it was just another string to our bow, and also, so it was a sort of everything worked in tandem. But it, I think we also wanted to do the talks in a very particular way to sort of fill what we thought was a void in architectural discussions. Try and change the format, take it back to this kind of cafe culture vibe, which to a certain degree we've achieved. I mean, obviously we're always honing it and improving it, and it's you know we're not quite there yet, but. Um, I think, yeah, it was this kind of reciprocal kind of um, exposure that mm. the restaurant could give us and we could give the restaurant, in a way, um, through architecture. What, what obstacles have you found? Because I mean, running a restaurant is hard and running an architecture practice is difficult. So how, what obstacles have you had to overcome in, in successfully executing both? Um, well, a lot of, of course, a lot of time. Uh, well, of course, you have a team that helps, mm. especially in the restaurant. Well, of course, that uh, they, they, they don't necessarily uh, fuse together, but the, it's uh, separated mm. and fin financially. Um, so, they, so they so they they operate as totally different businesses. Yes, it op operates as a yeah, it's a Venetian restaurant and bar, and. Um, yeah, I mean, at the beginning, at the beginning, we were much more involved mm. uh, for three, four years uh, on a daily basis, and then gradually it was uh, left uh, on its own to 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 run, not completely. Still. Yeah, that that is the aim. That is still uh, is still a lot of work. I mean, I've I've, I've 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 met other architects before who have dreamed of doing something like this before, or I've even met people who have done something similar, and it's gone. Yeah. I mean, it's, quite, it's quite common uh, in the architectural profession to have also a bar. It's not a unique, very unique. There's all, 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 all people are dreaming to have it. Or a lot of people actually do it mm. uh, on a side or some, uh, you know, 
partnership or some uh, I guess because we like to drink <laughs> and, and eat. <laughs> no, you don't. I I mean, I mean, it's it's interesting. I, I mean, I work at, at Rogers, and obviously the the relationship that their practice used to have with the River Cafe, yes. and again, you know, strong Italian culture there, and that restaurant became the place where most of the work got done, really. And yeah. it, you know, as, as Hugh was saying, it's our second meeting room, mm. and it's the social aspect that is very, very important. You, mm. know, you meet people, you meet them. Also, you know, is a lot of because the area, a lot of people are from the design world, so architects or design, interior designer. Or, so you, you really share a lot, in, the, in so you share ideas, and that's also what the, the, the Negroni talks we, we want to do, just to implement so, it. So it's actually facilitated new projects and new work that's come out of... Yeah, I mean, it, it has to a certain extent, as, as both you and Paolo said, it, it, it becomes um, um, potentially our shop front, mm. uh, a, a USP, a, a kind of a, a, an empty space to curate something um, different than just a, a, a bar restaurant. I mean, Paolo was always keen when we first saw that space uh, to get the, 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 f the feeling and the vibe of a Venetian Baccaro there. Um, and we knew felt knew, we knew fine that, um, that, that that it was one of those dreams that many architects have, but it was also, you know, I think it's kind of a common thing where, you know, you have a financial crash, two thousand eight, two thousand and nine. You're losing clients all over the shop. You're losing staff. You're thinking, right, what are we going to do here? And you sort of take the bull by the horns and you set up a bar restaurant. <laughs> is to sort of, because you had the time, we had the time then to do it. Now, we worked with two or three other people to set it up. And, mm. um, you know, a big shout would go out to Armand Teruli, who, who, who um, um, was an old friend of ours, who, who, who had a great get up and go in, in, in helping to make it happen with us. Um, but the remarkable thing was that we, we, we did this um, uh, with very little money. Made it happen, got the planning, put the toilets in, put all the kitchen stuff, put the structure in, and then, as Paolo said, it's been running itself for the last few years. Now, you mentioned the River Cafe kind of thing, and I think there is something strongly connected with the River Cafe, insofar there's a lot of people in this area who used to work at the River Cafe. <laughs> You've also got Abe Rogers moving into the street as well, who's a regular ombre. And the, 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 those people who worked at the River Cafe for many years, one is Kevin, who's downstairs on the ground floor, and then you've got Charlotte Cullinan across the road. Um, and they, they, they perceive ombre as being that kind of setup. Mm. It becomes important for the local community as well as just important for us. It's got a lot of good support with a lot of the people who work and live in the area because it kind of functions as that kind of hub. I, I, I suspect some people would see it as a hub mm. um, um, at the end of the street on Viner Street. Yeah, it, was, it wasn't just a, a business operation, also because, I mean, it's a tiny business. It's not, it's not, yeah, it's not making us millionaires. But also was uh, uh, what we called um, um, urban acupuncture. So it made a change in the area, really. We were the f first in, the, the road was really uh, run down and uh, full of junkies, especially the front of where Omra is. The, we did the deck, was, uh, we built the deck in front. It before was uh, just a rubbish tip and broken uh, taxi parked. So we actually created something that is, it made a change. So it wasn't only, again, I mean, be, being architects, we, we did this something for the city. Yeah. Got it. So uh, really kind of giving something back, being part, facilitating a community in the area. Yeah, and I think, it, you know, it's just a way of showing off your skills, isn't it? I mean, it, it had every component, even though it's very small scale, it's a sort of a macro version of what we do on bigger jobs, you know. Mm. I mean, the, the deck was a was a bin store car park, you know, you're, res you're, you're creating new environments, really, and you know, the outside space particularly was always the selling point of, the, of, the, of it as a venue particularly in summer, but of course it's become really key to us being able to build the Altana and things in, in conjunction with LFA and have, a, have an outside room in effect where you've, there's enough space for you to construct things. So I think, you know, there's, um, 
it's sort of a mixture of things. It's an op it creates opportunities for things to happen you know, with the talks and with the, with the with the, um, um, sort of installations. And then there's also the kind of the kind of trying to set a tone around what you do. So there's a you know obviously these guys work um, very closely with the wine supply. The chef who's in is very particular about the food, and it's it's although it looks kind of fairly. Um, sort of relaxed and informal there's a kind of a, a seriousness to mm. the offer you know to make that as good as possible and i think yeah. then when people go there it means that the, the sell for us for our, ourselves and the practice is relatively straightforward because you just people can sort of see it coming out you don't have to sell it mm. it's just there present so and that's the same with meeting new people you know it's an, it's a good icebreaker you know it's, it's a good way of uh, being introduced to new people who you would not really have had the opportunity to meet and Obviously, Negroni Talks really helps that. Well, what would you say you've learned from running a restaurant that you can Im implement in running an architecture practice? And also, what have you learned in running the architecture business that get, gets implemented into the restaurant? Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Good question. Um, at the beginning of um, um, running Ombra, um, Paolo and I found it almost impossible dealing with a, a mad chef called Andrea who was part of our business kind of set up with them. Um, you were talking about someone who was uh, an, a, a real natural proprietor, a great person, great laugh, uh, life and soul of the party, but stubborn as an ox. You know, he was just really, really immovable. Mm. So any little change that would improve the quality was met with no and that's how you would say it. It was the definitive no. So a lot of the early days of Ombra was about learning how to sort of trick Andrea into thinking <laughs> that what his idea was was um, um, good for um, Ombra uh, and so forth. So you know, it was, it was about kind of um, 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 carefully um, um, sort of um, navigating. Um, the, 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 the difficulties on of a, 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 a chef who was stubborn, you know, um, the the big lesson w um, that was learned there was potentially going down. What what well, the lesson I think was was probably being able to sum up in black and white where we were, mm. give them a few ultimatums, and keep the communication nice and clear. But then there was other lessons we were finding about bringing in the right people that could maybe kind of either annoy them or work with them. You know, gradually that changes, and we, we we've now got a new 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 uh, manager and chef in Ombra who, who who works who's still as stubborn, <laughs> but we learn we've learned a lot more, and the communication we keep um, um, it, it, it very much with the aim to progress and improve at all time. And I think there lies the rub about what we've probably picked up from um, um, Ombra, psychologically and kind of business-wise, is, is bringing a level of communication responsibility throughout force space and just people that work with force space mm. and people that collaborate with force space to sort of have that aim, uh, communication and aim to sort of progress and improve. And for staff, and maybe given in initiative and responsibilities to sort of allow them to perform better, just as you would at the front of house on a bar. Yeah. Um, so there's that kind of crossover. Two completely different businesses. Yeah. So it really, and also the 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 final product. I mean, the the okay, architecture uh, take uh, building take years, and you have a relationship with the client is really long, and the process is incredibly long. A restaurant is an instant satisfaction. The mm. client is in front of you, one second, a glass of wine, a smile, and it's gone. Done. So it's really, maybe that's why I was attracted to it. Because yes. uh, you, you, to have satisfaction in, in, in practice is, uh, is almost impossible. You know, you, you, you have this very, very long project. You can love it as much as you can. Mm. But at the end, you're just so tired, you, want to, you <laughs> don't want to see it. You know. Where there, you have, you really, you have. You are you give to the client satisfaction, uh, happiness, mm. and you have uh, uh, a smile in return. So it's, it's uh, gratifying. So, yeah. yeah, no, I like that. Uh, well, they do smile, but they <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but also they don't. 
<laughs> I love that. I also think there was a, there's a there's a factor where the that that industry's appears from an outside point of view to be qu- quite unforgiving. You know, um, you get people going in there reviewing. Yeah. Um, I think that was kind of a served as a sort of a warning shot for us in terms of practice about how you can be misread and how important you know presentation is and how you're perceived is mm-hmm. actually something you have to keep worry about a little bit because people can get the wrong side at the end of the stick so i think that has happened you know more obviously with and as paolo is saying because you've got so many more clients coming through the door day on day um but then you've got this extra hidden critic aspect um that's happened over the over the history of the restaurant so yeah as an architecture firm you're there saying well how, how are we presenting ourselves are do people because I think that does translate into business mm. you know, in, in terms of opportunity and people can be discounting you when you're quite capable of doing the job so I think that was a kind of an interesting insight into potentially maybe reviewing what we were doing up here uh, as it came out of the restaurant so. mm. I forgot to say that also in the restaurant the client pays immediately <laughs> 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 the dream client <laughs> the dream client yes and and how would you say on the on the flip side how how does the architecture practice influence the running of the restaurant, or which would you say is and when which is harder? Well, I I see I see as I said earlier I think there's there's an aspect of how how, how you might deal with staff or how the the place represents itself whether it's the restaurant or the or the, or the practice. There's a communication um, issue which can somehow connects both of them too. But as Paolo says, they are very different. So your question is really about how um, ombre might um, affect um, um, force space. Um, force space has probably been affected by ombre slightly, but I think we always had it at force space, and that is not to take ourselves too seriously, mm. um, not to have an office which is strict, overly demanding. Um, working all hours, or annoyingly architectural. Um, we, we, we want a, 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 an atmosphere in the office which is hard working. When we did this building, it was about making very simple spaces that you could just get in and get on with things mm. and not get distracted by stuff. Um, and we're, we're not an architect's office that kind of dresses things up and, and, and puts things up on the wall that models everywhere and photos of our work everywhere and all that sort of thing. Um, we're almost too busy to start window dressing. Yeah. Um, and I think that slight looseness, if you want to call it a looseness, is maybe a little bit influenced by Ombra. Mm. Like, a, like a culture. Yeah, like a culture. I don't know if you want to add to that you know, about the, the the feel of the office and you know things that. Yeah, I think uh, obviously I mean, the environmental thing transcends the look look and feel of a place. Um, I think instantly conveys. You know, as soon as you come through a door, you you've sort of half made your mind up what kind of place you're in. Um, I mean, obviously there's a huge danger in that as well. Is that, that it looks unfocused? It looks a bit slack, mm. lazy like you haven't thought about it and i think it's a very fine balance snap between um you know making um yourselves look um s- sort of irreverent and easygoing and approachable um and uh, yeah sort of without an, a veneer of gloss if you like um and um making sure you're being you're you're very aware of that at all, all times and that's a very deliberate conscious act in a way mm. um you know, one of the things when we um, reviewed all the uh, the past work with the website was that, you know, it's like we just don't have an obvious branded office. You know, we have a range of projects. Some have failed more than others. Some are a bit more successful than others. Aesthetically, they're all over the place. It's a real collage of, of stuff. Um, but that's life in a way, you know, and, and you kind of, uh, you just respond to what you what opportunities come up in the best way you can with your skill set. Mm. Um, and the results are, you know, very specific to the time and place and, and everything else um, with the with the project. So, you know, you know, in a way, you're we were forced into a, you know, we're not like an office where you have a, a set way of um, uh, illustrating your projects, a style. The the jobs themselves in sight don't obviously 
you wouldn't say that two different jobs were done necessarily by the same architect. It's not that obvious. So then you're trying again to not exactly combat that, but to sort of make that a virtue actually, and uh, say this is a way of looking at the world, a way of approaching. Mm. Um, one of the things we've been experimenting with recently is a brochure which has actually no finished work in it. Um, that's kind of high risk in lots of ways because you know it, it sort of doesn't say to anybody what you're actually about. But in a way, it says everything that you, what you're about. So we're always like interested in trying to push that side of it and say, is there an alternative way of doing it? Because we all know what an architectural book looks like and a, a practice portfolio or a, or a monograph. Um, and that that's a very, uh, it's become a very, um, you know, that consistency of presentation is, is often there, which we just simply didn't have. Yeah. Um, and also, you know, you're trying to, shoehorn different uh, attitudes to architecture and different uh, strengths so you know you just go with the flow a little bit more and don't don't force fit it into something mm. and uh, yeah i think that that's we see that kind of more as a strength than a negative I, I you know initially we started out thinking maybe that's a negative you know that perception of the office what do people make of us when, when they look from the outside but i think if you just keep backing it up uh and you know, Negroni is a, Negroni talks is a good way of doing that because it's varied. You know, the speakers are very varied. You know, we try and mix it up as much as we possibly can. We don't really go to, you know, we try not to stick to the same people coming back and re return people. And then we're looking outside beyond architecture mm. as well. So, you know, always trying to. And how, and how do the Negroni talks come about? And for for the audience who don't know what they are, what how would you describe them? Um. They probably came about because we were sitting with our PR team in Ombra over a few bottles of wine thinking what we could do with the space. Right. Um, you know, because we knew that we wanted to do something. Uh, it was just a question of what. And then, obviously, Negroni as a, as a drink, which was there with the spritz and, um, and everything else, it just sounded right to do something like that hinged around the, the venue. Um, the talks themselves, it was just our desire to do something beyond beyond architecture, as I said before, and, and to not have, to really get away from the, the panel audience. Mm. That was the key driver. Um, we've all been to those talks. We had actually, we remarked on it as we were chatting, saying, you know, when was the last time any of us had been to an architectural talk? And it was a very long, long time ago. Mm. And I think that sort of distance of audience and expert panel was one that I didn't particularly enjoy going to that environment to listen to about my subject and also I'd sort of got drugged away by other stuff like film and art and other interests and architecture had fallen away somewhat yeah. in terms of what I read about and was interested to read about um, so yeah it was, it was primarily a means of getting you know joining up the cafe with trying to deconstruct the architectural discussion format into something much more exciting mm. and then we the only other thing to say on top of that was that we felt, felt that it needed to be a little bit provocative you yeah know? that we wanted people with opinions. We weren't interested in bringing people along as sacred cows, not to be shot down uh, verbally. And okay, we wanted it to be polite, but we also wanted it to be slightly anarchic and you know, unreadable. You yeah. know? So we didn't really know what was gonna happen of an evening. Provocative is a key thing within the Groni talks. Um, you know, it came out of discussions. We were sort of asking ourselves questions like, how do, how, how do we use Ombra? How, what do we do to bring out this kind of, um, a, a maybe a kind of slight frustration that we all had is like, as, as practitioners, is like, okay, what else can we do other than just um, solve architectural problems, planning problems, detail problems? how to finish a building, all these kind of things. Um, the Negroni Talks became a, 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 a mode of curation. You know, it allowed us to be curators and, and to investigate themes and provoke debate. Mm. It all kind of snapped together quite quickly, as Hugh said, over those bottles of wine, and Rob, Rob Fine was a huge help on that. Um, because it all, all slipped into place, and we realized that at once you could start to go towards that cafe society, that kind of um, um, turn of the 20th century kind of vibe where everybody's got some ideas or some provocative thing to say. Mm. Um, now, <laughs> each of the Negroni Talks aims to sort of kick that off with a question or a theme, like, where is the punk in architecture? Well, there might not be any punk in architecture, but it was about having a, a fairly convivial debate to challenge some of those ideas. 
um, of, 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 of rebelliousness in architecture, and if there really is any true punk in architecture. Um, the one on Brexit um, got a bit emotional. Um, um, the one on um, uh, language was full of wonderful, wonderful kind of... Um, Vignettes and little stories and, and 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 anecdotes from the likes of Paul Finch and um, Hugh Pierman and um, Peter Murray. Um, um, that almost became a show for them and 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 and, and, and its own, which starts to give you ideas on the growing talks. Each one can potentially be different. Yeah. As long as you keep it provocative and real and 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 how people you know and, and inspire people to engage within it. That being said, what it does allow, what has been fantastic to see, is is, is a younger audience coming, the student interest in it, mm. and I think it's a wonderful opportunity to sort of embrace um, these kind of topics with these kind of speakers in a small look, um, venue like Ombra, where everything is spread around, and the speakers might be sitting there and here, and the chairs in the corner, sort of helping control things, and people are eating and drinking. And then people after the talk are maybe kind of hanging around and get a chance to meet one of their heroes. Or yeah. a student ends up coming out with a few questions of their own that floors everyone. So it really becomes a really nice little kind of test bed of ideas, which I, I think everybody's beginning to see some benefits for. And, and we've got another eight planned um, that are coming up. And um, every time we're talking about them, it's always exciting to, mm. to sort of um, formulate them. And, and we're now finding that we're getting a lot of people approaching us to speak at them rather than us having to sort of um, 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 and go into all of our own professional networks and get favors from people. So it's, it's been good. Um, one of the th key things with that was the staff that we had in the office at the time. You know, they were all guys in late twenties, and I mean, we're all forty odd and, and above. Um, and uh, it was a way for us, um, whilst defining something about ourselves, also to try and stay a bit relevant. Um, so, I mean, often the work defines you <coughs> rather than the, the other way. You define the work, unless mm. you're obviously a, a very, very design-led practice. Um, and uh, so we, we brought those guys in to really try and help us um, kind of um, yeah, connect because I think, you know, as students, we could all probably say that, yeah, there's events on and there might be more events on now than there ever were back, say, 20 years ago. And it's much more accessible, but it's, a, it's sort of about the accessibility, you know, so that, uh, you know, you could have, uh, as Steve's saying, you could, ha you could come along as a student and you could be stood right next to somebody who you would never really have a chance to speak to. Mm -hmm. um, whether that's somebody quite high up in journalism or whether that's a practice boss or anything. Um, and you can just talk to them as a fellow human being. You yeah. know, there's no pitch. Yeah. You know, um, and that's what's been really nice is that, and he, you know, obviously there have been a lot of architects there. Um, you know, it's never, you've never felt there's been kind of any issue. You know, it's just been people coming for the right reasons um, and not talking shop. You know, yeah. it's... Uh, um, so the, I mean, I, I must say, when I've, the, the one I've come to, I found it the, one of the most easiest places to start conversations, just because of the informal environment around it, and you know, everyone's kind of just sort of bubbling and and talking and enjoying their Negronis as well, which helps. Yeah, and um, yeah, it's partly to get out the office environment. After all, you know, I mean, that's um, you know, and uh, things are best discussed over drink usually. <laughs> So what's next? What's next for Ombra and for Fort and for Fort Space? Well, um, um, Ombra, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, we, we we can talk about um, maybe on a, a kind of restaurant business forum or something like that. <laughs> um, it is Paolo Pic, um, and Dead Stress. It is a separate business, and and um, with with Mitchell, who's our, our, our current chef and, and and manager, we brought him in as a director, and he's doing fantastic. There's an awful lot of trust there now and, and regular communication. The crossover kind of futures is, 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 is there's, a, there's going to be a, a whole series of um, Negroni talks coming up in the summer. Uh, there'll be one or two before that. We'll probably encourage one or two special edition Negroni talks. We did one with uh, New London Architecture um, a couple of Mondays ago. Um, the crossover that we did last year was the Altana uh, with London Festival of Architecture 
and we we co-designed and built that with Nicholas Henninger from Exist, who's an old collaborator and friend of ours. And we like his drive and his energy and, you know, can-do kind of approach where we're not necessarily having to worry too much about all the red tape and the construction contracts and so forth. We can just you know collaborate together properly, meaningfully, and get it up and running on time and mm. you know big success and all that. We were thinking about another project like that this summer. The, there is op- opportunities to sort of bring in different, different forms of curating, um, uh, uh, whether that is a slightly different type of event in Ombra, but at the moment, Ombra events um, um, uh, work quite nicely on on Mondays, uh, where we allow the business to sort of you know go as it goes during the week, and then usually norm, Ombra is closed on a Monday. That's when we're doing the Grony talks, and Mitchell will do guest chef things. We 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 we've considered doing exhibitions there, for example. Mm. Um, we doubt we will be doing those um, in any way that would be uh, familiar to anyone expecting an exhibition. If it was an exhibition, it would be an exhibition that would probably be um, unusual because there's not an awful lot of wall space. So it's like, what, what, what are you exhibiting there yeah. and why? So those questions are things that we're looking at now. And we're doing some ongoing research projects at the moment as well in four space where it's looking at airspace development, looking at infill development, and all these kind of um, forgotten, unseen sites. I'm not going to divulge too much detail in that, but that kind of research, local research, contextual research, Mm. is often born out of the discussions that you might have with some of the speakers at Negroni Talks, or ourselves with with others in in, in Ombra, or with clients in Ombra. So um, there's always discussions happening in, 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 in Ombra and um, even this podcast we were considering doing it in Ombra but we thought it might be a little bit noisy but we are considering maybe looking at um, podcast yeah. and, um, curation in, in Ombra at some point which will have a four space involvement. These are all ideas and as I said I think um, having the, 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 that luxury of um, uh, an art, being an art, having that luxury of a restaurant or bar restaurant as part of the or partly connected with the practice is 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 about it being a, a, a zone where you can test ideas. Brilliant. Thank you very much. So that is a wrap. Thank you for listening. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond, or commitment, except to help you be unstoppable.